Before we talk about the specifics of amino acid metabolism, I want to stop for a moment and remember how our body actually digests and absorbs proteins from our diet. So on average, a person on a US diet ingests anywhere from 70 to 100 grams of protein every single day. And this makes up the majority of the nitrogen that we actually take in on a daily basis. The problem with protein is it's actually a relatively large and bulky macromolecule. And the cells of our intestines can't actually absorb this large macromolecule. And so what has to happen is within our GI tract, we have to break down the protein into smaller unit, so into amino acids, dipeptides, and tripeptides before the enterocytes of the small intestine can actually absorb it into the body. Now digestion of dietary protein begins within our stomach. So our stomach is lined by many different types of specialized cells. So we have chief, cell, uh, chief cells, we have parietal cells, we have gastric cells, and so forth. And each one of these cells plays an important role in contributing to the formation of what we call the gastric juice. So when we ingest food, it basically becomes immersed within a gastric juice found within our stomach. And two important components of gastric juice that are important to digestion of dietary protein are hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen. So let's take a moment and talk about each one of these components. Let's begin with the gastric acid. So gastric acid is basically hydrochloric acid, and that's released by the parietal cells of the stomach. And the hydrochloric acid actually has many roles. So it lowers the pH to about two to three. And that basically acts as an immune defense against pathogens such as bacteria. So if there is some bacteria present in the food that we ingest, this acid basically kills that bacteria off. The second thing that it does, it begins denaturing the structure of the protein. So normally the structure of the protein, for example, looks like this. So it's a very large, very compact structure. But when it's placed into this very acidic environment, it basically denatures, it opens up, it unfolds. And so as it unfolds, it gives access to all these peptide bonds, which now can be acted on uh, acted upon by all these different types of proteolytic enzymes that we have within our body. And one important proteolytic enzyme that actually is secreted by cells within a stomach called chief cells is pepsinogen. So pepsinogen is the inactive form of pepsin. And hydrochloric acid actually converts pepsinogen into pepsin. So pepsin is produced in the pepsinogen form by chief cells released into the gastric juice and hydrochloric acid then converts it into pepsin. In addition, other active pepsin molecules can also convert pepsinogen into pepsin. But either way, once we form pepsin, pepsin begins to cleave some of these bonds to form smaller polypeptides, so smaller than that initial large structure of the protein. And all of this gets mixed in and then eventually empties out into the duodenum, into the first compartment of the small intestine. Now once these polypeptides reach the intestine, they begin further breakdown by the activity of pancreatic enzymes which are produced and released by the pancreas. So this includes enzymes such as trypsin and chymotrypsin as well as elastase and carboxypeptidase. Now, just like pepsinogen is released in its inactive zymogen form, all these pancreatic enzymes also are initially released in the inactive zymogen form. So we first have to activate them before they can begin cleaving those polypeptides. Now, what's the signal that causes the pancreas to actually release these pancreatic enzymes? Well, when the food makes its way makes its way into the duodenum that stimulates the release of these hormones called cholecystokinin so cck as well as secretin and these can act on the pancreas to release the pancreatic juices and enzymes into the duodenum of the small intestine now, each one of these enzymes has its own specific specificity. And what that means is they cleave peptide bonds adjacent to specific amino acid groups, amino acid R groups. But what actually converts them from the zymogen inactive form to the active enzymatic form? 
Well, an enzyme found on the luminal surface of the intestinal mucosa known as enteropeptidase is responsible for initially converting trypsinogen into its active trypsin form. And once activated, trypsin then goes on to activate all the other pancreatic enzymes released by the pancreas. Now, I want to pause for a moment and talk about important clinical pearls. So, what happens if a patient's pancreas stops functioning? If, a, if the pancreas isn't functioning very well, so this is what we call pancreatic insufficiency. So this is seen in patients with chronic pancreatitis, in patients who have uh, resection of the pancreas because of a surgical procedure, in patients with cystic fibrosis, and other conditions. But basically, pancreatic insufficiency means the pancreas isn't producing and releasing those uh, enzymes into the duodenum. And so what that means is we're not going to be able to break down the proteins and fats. And so all that undigested and unbroken down protein and fat eventually ends up in a stool. And this is known as steatorrhea. So steatorrhea is the presence of fat and undigested protein within a stool. And so steatorrhea causes the formation of these very large and pale and oily looking stools that are very difficult to flush. And this actually becomes a problem because if we can digest and break down all those macromolecules, proteins and fats, we're not going to be able to absorb them into the body and this can actually cause malnutrition. And the way that we fix this problem is we actually have to give patients these pancreatic enzymes to replace the enzymes so that we can digest all the, all, uh, all the food that we take in into the body. Now, once we break down these polypeptides into oligopeptides, that's not the end of the story. The next stop is we actually have to further break down those oligopeptides into individual amino acids, dipeptides, and tripeptides. And this occurs as a result of the presence of aminopeptidases, which are present on the luminal surface of intestinal mucosal cells. And so once we form these amino acids, dipeptides, and tripeptides, now the enterocytes use specialized membrane transporters to actually move those amino acids, di and tripeptides, into the cell. Now, once the di and tripeptides are within the cytoplasm of the enterocytes, that's when we further break them down into their individual amino acid form. And then those amino acids are released into the portal circulation. The portal circulation carries the amino acids to the liver. And in the liver, we can either use amino acids to help form other biological molecules or we can use amino acids for other purposes, or if we don't need them, we break them down. But some of those amino acids are released into the general circulation, and that's what makes up that amino acid pool that we talked about in the previous lecture. And so I want to finish off by talking about the transport of amino acids in our body. So it turns out that the amount of amino acids inside the cells is actually much greater than outside the cells. And so what that means is if we want to move amino acids from outside the cell into the cell, we have to move it against a gradient. And what allows us to move that is the specialized transporter proteins present on the membrane of cells. And these utilize ATP. So they hydrolyze ATP to move amino acids into cells. So levels of amino acids inside cells are much higher than in the extracellular space due to, uh, due to the presence of these ATP driven transporters present on these cells. So they basically hydrolyze ATP and use the energy in that hydrolysis process to actively pump amino acids into the cell. And then the cell can use those amino acids for a variety of purposes, for example, to build new proteins or enzymes. Now, I want to finish off by talking about another clinical pearl, a condition known as cystinuria. So cystinuria is an autosomal recessive condition in which we have a mutation or a defect or an absence of the amino acid transporter present in the proximal convoluted tubule of the kidneys that's responsible for absorbing enzymes, cis, um, amino acids, cysteine, lysine, arginine, and orthonine. So in these patients, normally the proximal convoluted tubule should be able to absorb all of these amino acids which are filtered by the glomeruli. 
But because they don't have or have a defect in this transporter, they can't absorb these amino acids and these amino acids end up depositing within a lumen of the tubules. And so that can actually cause the formation of kidney stones, so cysteine kidney stones. And so the way that we treat this is we ensure the patient actually drinks a lot of water because if they drink a lot of water, then we can clear the tubules and the lumen of the tubules of these amino acids.